hey, before we get in this episode, can you do us a favor? We go ahead and subscribe to the channel. We ring that notification bell. And if you would, give this video a like. Well, enough of that mumbo jumbo. Let's get to the episode. Let's talk developmentally speaking, glow up, and connecting through wrestling. What made you get into the entertainment industry? Well, honey, I just came out of the womb just entertaining as all get out. So I don't even know uh, when that started. I was a clown as a child, and I'm a clown now. So, uh, you know, I started entertaining probably at a very early age. As a profession, I think that I always wanted to be part of the entertainment world, but I actually wanted to write entertainment journalism. And I wanted, believe it or not, you this is going to be hard for some people to accept, but in a previous lifetime, I was going to go to college. I, I have two degrees, but I was going to go on and get a master's degree in broadcast communication and become an entertainment attorney. Believe it or not, that was the plan. Um, and then I decided that I just did not want to be sitting around writing contracts for other people mm -hmm. to entertain when I'm just so glorious and could entertain them myself and come up with my own contracts if I needed to. <laughs> so at what point did you decide to switch gears? Because I, I was reading online a little bit and you, you've done a lot of interviews, you've worked with a lot of celebrities. What I've done uh, all kinds of things, darling. Mm -hmm. It's been a long and winding road to get here. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so what what made the shift to professional wrestling? Well, a little known fact um, is that very early in my life, I had, um, as I was in college, I started to watch a local professional wrestling broadcast in cleveland ohio it was on public access television and i they had a phone number and i called it and i was 18 at the time and i joined them as a professional wrestling personality very quickly um it just was not an experience that was as fulfilling for me i think i was overwhelmed i was too young i was too inexperienced i was too lacking in self-confidence to really do that on screen in that capacity. And then a few years later, I went back to that same company and I did uh, broadcast journalism for them. I was doing play by play and color commentary on their weekly public access television show in Cleveland, Ohio. And that was the Masters of Mayhem professional wrestling organization, um, Great Lakes Championship Wrestling in Cleveland. And then even prior to that, I had done interviews with professional wrestlers as a child, like, you know, in high school. And I was submitting those to professional Pro Wrestling Illustrated, and that was my goal, is to grow up and kind of work for that kind of a company in that publication. And again, as I said, it's been a long and winding road, but many years later, I was covering celebrities for Huffington Post, and I was interviewing, you know, really mainstream stars, Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Kelly Clarkson, whoever, you know, these big name singers, movie stars, etc. And I recognized that, in my mind, there are no bigger stars or celebrities than professional wrestlers, so I started doing uh, professional wrestling interviews and interviewing people like Batista and Stone Cold Steve Austin. And th that would tell you kind of how long ago that was. Mm -hmm. And then in the, as that continued and progressed, I eventually interviewed some people who were gonna be coming to my local area here in Northern California and an opportunity presented itself to come and participate in the world of professional wrestling as what we're seeing here. And it's just been non-stop since then so that that's what triggered it all so the your first time doing it out there was it just addicting like you just had to have more of it well look i had grown up that you know one of the things i think that people look at me and would not recognize right away until perhaps speaking to me or doing a little investigation is that i'm a lifelong professional wrestling fan mm -hmm. and i've experienced many instances where not as much anymore because I'm fairly prolific in the world of professional wrestling and people have come to know some of my backstory, but initially people thought I was just a gimmick that was out there, you know, like somebody who was brought in to be over the top, the, the, to be this. Mm -hmm. And what they failed to recognize is that underneath all of this glamor is a very extensive semi-encyclopedic knowledge and the inner workings of professional wrestling dating back decades and decades and specifics to 
the Southern wrestling territories, which were what I grew up watching, what I grew up loving. Mm -hmm. So when I came into the world of professional wrestling is this, it was an unexpected blending of things that I love, of personalities and personas that I had developed for 15 years, or at that time, only about 10 years, because I've been in wrestling now almost seven years. Uh, a 10 year old persona, this, that I had developed in other entertainment industries and brought into the world of professional wrestling, I've always wanted to be there. It wasn't a fact or a case of being addicted for my first go round. I was addicted mm -hmm. before I ever got there. And once I was there, I recognized how perfectly it paired up and, and it was such an opportunity for me to live the lifelong dream I had always had in a way that was virtually unexpected for, for me. I thought that I would perhaps be a Jim Cornette-esque manager or mm -hmm. Jimmy Cornette, uh, Jim Cornette, Jimmy Hart, those in types of over the top personalities. But it just came to be that I had the opportunity to become something much closer to what I had really, really grown up loving, which were those iconic women of the mid eighties into the early nineties. Absolutely. So when you, when you first started this, did you just stick in that Northern California area or when did you start traveling and getting, getting your name out there? Yeah. The, the initial part, I think of my journey is not unlike any other professional wrestling personality. You work with what's close to you. You work with who's willing to work with you, what's available to you. And the part of it that was, ex I would say that it was unexpected for me is that I had a mindset initially that this character persona was very limited to where I could work. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that it would probably only work in my hometown area, Northern California, known to be quite open-minded, liberal, um, LGBTQ focused in many ways. And so I thought that this was a given here, but I didn't think that it would take off other places. And then through my work as a journalist and a variety of other ways, I came into contact with Mickey James. So my story really um, starts um, kind of evolving after a, a good bit of time where I had been doing this on a localized level. And then Mickey James kind of discovered my work, brought me to NWA for the Empowered All Women's Pay-Per-View. And then once I had been exposed on that level, um, you know, things really did take off even more so. The first time I traveled out of the Bay Area to do pro wrestling was for Effie's Big Gay Brunch in Tampa, Florida. That was Big Gay Brunch 2. We're coming up on Big Gay Brunch 6, by the way. <laughs> Anybody who's listening to this, get your asses to Los Angeles for the collective weekend. Effie's Big Gay Brunch 6 is taking place on 11 a.m., Pacific Standard Time on April 1st. It's not an April's Fool's Day joke. It's <laughs> we're going to be there. We're going to be uh, doing what we love. And that was my first time traveling out of town. And then that opened an entirely different world to me. But and, and I think that that's also what brought me to the attention probably of Mickey James. And, you know, since then, it's just exploded for me. So the first time that she brought you into NWA, you've been a mainstay ever since? I wish. Uh, <laughs> I, I showed up in August of 2021 mm -hmm. for the entire pay-per-view and once i was i had my foot in the door once you get those very large high heels in the door you just don't pull them out you know it's like i was a thorn in their side for uh upwards of eight months i went back many times without being necessarily invited like they mm -hmm. didn't have a role for me on air there was not a position for me or an opportunity for me but i believe that when you want something badly enough, you're going to show up and just keep asking like, Hey, is you know something for me, anything for me? And what that allowed me to do is I've gotten to work in so many different and bizarre random capacities with the national wrestling Alliance, which is the, the company that I grew up idolizing and loving the place that I always dreamed of working uh, again, not necessarily like this, but working, doing what I'm doing in a different way. And as a result, I've gotten to do everything from, being a runner backstage to producing two two episodes of 10 pounds of gold that focused on the Matt Cardona, Trevor Murdoch, Nick Aldis stories. So we really got to focus on those for, for two episodes of the 10 pounds of gold. And I was there doing production work behind the scenes and getting credit as a producer. So that was incredible. And then ultimately I showed up and they had an opportunity for me. And obviously everybody now probably is aware that I'm with the National Wrestling Alliance. I'm paired up with 
Big Daddy Thrill, the Thrill Billy, Silas, Mice, and Honey. We are the it couple of the National Wrestling Alliance. <laughs> You see, I think that's what lacks a lot of today is you, you put in the work and the effort and you went down there. A lot of people don't show up. They don't, you know, unless they're, they don't know. I think that a lot of people, unfortunately, don't know that that's something that's even available to them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the things I will tell you, people may have varying opinions of the National Wrestling Alliance, but from an inside perspective, one of the things I can assure you is that there is no shortage of incredible talent that wants to be mm-hmm. part of what we're producing. Every time we travel to a new city and we are touring much more often, even when we were based in Nashville doing TV taping, TV tapings there, um, the amount of talent that shows up to audition, to have their faces seen, their names learned is overwhelming. And I think a big part of that is because wherever we go, we will often partner up with either a localized promotion mm-hmm. or a localized training facility. And many of the people within the National Wrestling Alliance run very amazing training facilities on their own right. So we often get to work with some of their hottest prospects. They will be there. They will do all of the things behind the scenes that are necessary in many mm-hmm. capacities to get recognized. Unless you are that massive breakout star that's like burning up the internet that everybody's wanting to know about. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if you are not that individual, the way to to get ahead in this industry, in my experience, is to network, to meet people, to be helpful. And we get to see a lot of incredible young talent doing that. And it's a blessing for me because I love to to meet these young aspiring stars of the future. And I've met just some really lovely people that way. That I, I feel like I can relate in that aspect. I used to work for Gabe Sapolsky when he did Evolve and Dragon Gate, and I, I've always loved that level of where they're starting out and they grow. Like when I do my other show, Developmentally Speak, like I focus on developmental because I like people's stories and their journeys. I like I like from point A to point B because that's where the most passion is, I feel. That's, you know, when they find who they are and then they just build and build and build. And they put in that work and that effort. And I feel like the NWA gives that space for those people. It's, it's professional wrestling in a sports entertainment world. And it's really, really starting to grow more and more as it goes on. There's two parts to that statement um, that I want to address. First of all, I am so appreciative and grateful to Gabe Sapolsky. You know, Gabe and I connected through social media. We met on Twitter. Uh, Gabe if you are part of the industry hosts these Twitter spaces, usually on Wednesday evenings, um, sometimes on Sundays, and they are great networking opportunities via social media for anybody who is an aspiring personality or member of the pro wrestling industry. And that can be from commentators to people who wanna work backstage, behind the scenes or in ring. In any capacity, you can go in there and just soak up this incredible amount of knowledge. But the benefit of those spaces, in my experience, has been just an incredible wealth of individuals you can connect with via social media, where you can learn more about what's happening in the world of professional wrestling today in places that are outside of your reach of a territory locally. Mm -hmm. And the, the other part of that that I want to address, of course, is the National Wrestling Alliance. Um... The National Wrestling Alliance, as the oldest existing, continuously promoting and running wrestling brand in the world pretty much today, um, is in a different place now than it was back in the 80s. Um, we are have gone through changes of, of ownership five years now. We've been part of the Lightning One era with Billy Corgan, um, who is so passionate about professional wrestling in his own right, at the helm as our owner and the CEO of that company. And what we strive to give our viewers is um, a healthy dose of older school types of professional wrestling with some modern new twists. You know, we are looking at things like we've got well-established names, we've got up and coming stars. And one of the things that I think for better or worse that people experience in the NWA is that individuals can come in they can be newer in the industry and they can sort of have a feeling out process where they get Mm -hmm. um, some direction but a lot of opportunity to see what they want to become 
in the world of professional wrestling without having a character entirely assigned to them. And what we also get to see are flourishes of genuine genius at times where people are just so incredibly good at what they do and can tell stories that are sometimes unexpected with characters that you would not anticipate being in part of such a tradition based company like NWA <laughs> and Silas and I, I think are this beautiful marriage of something that is very, very, very traditional and old school with something that is an extremely modern twist on that. You know, um, Silas, it, I cannot say enough about the Thrillbilly Silas Mason, first and foremost. I hope the listeners have had the opportunity to watch your interview with Silas to learn more about him. I hope that they will tune in to NWA every Tuesday at 6.05 p.m. on uh, Eastern Time on the NWA's YouTube and Saturdays at noon Eastern on the YouTube uh, for NWA. And they get to see Silas and me and many others. But Silas is not a gimmick. You know, so that's just who he is. And that's why it reads as so authentic and yet so incredibly entertaining because he is. And our pairing, as ridiculous as it may look on screen at times, and as certainly as ridiculous as it would be if you looked at it on paper, is so organic, it's so natural. And we have a genuine chemistry that you just can't fake. If it, if it was, if it was all faked, you would know it. Absolutely. He spoke nothing but kind things about you and he damn well better. <laughs> <laughs> I know the NWA is, ret- is coming to Chicago in April. Are you excited about that? Oh, I'm immensely excited. You know, Chicago is such a hotbed for professional wrestling and it always has been. I've been there many times um, myself as not just for wrestling, you know, the two major times that I was there for professional wrestling have focused on the GCW collective weekends and Effie's big gay brunch. We've been there twice and the reception has been off the charts, but also that Midwestern type of wrestling was a significant part of NWA's history and heritage. And I'm really excited for the, those fans to have the opportunity to experience NWA on April 7th for our pay-per-view 312 um, live on pay-per-view and live there in the Chicago area. And then I, I'm really hopeful that they'll come in and watch what it's like at one of our studio television tapings, because that's an entirely different kind mm-hmm. of experience. It's so intimate and so much fun. And the audience actually has an opportunity to be part of that broadcast. And I don't mean that just by being present. I mean, they give those broadcasts their energy and they can make or break people honestly sometimes Mm -hmm. like i look back at silas and myself and if the audience in those early nashville tv tapings in the studios there had not taken to us so unbelievably well perception of us might have been very very different you know but coming to chicago for us i think is huge because the chicago area has not had that opportunity to see us live in many years it's also huge because it is a signal of what is to come in the future for the National Wrestling Alliance, which is a lot more opportunities for fans outside of our traditional filming areas and locations to see the stars of the National Wrestling Alliance live and to see what we're really about and experience us. Because I think that experiencing professional wrestling live can truly change the perception you have of a company, of the product, of the individuals, of the talent. I could not agree more. I'd like to ask you one more question, if that's okay. You've seen... Oh, my God. You can ask me thousands of questions. <laughs> I, I did not look this stunning. To have a okay. I'm an all-nighter. <laughs> if you could give anybody advice on getting into professional wrestling, you've kind of seen it from all angles here. What, what would it be? You know, getting into wrestling is a lot different than succeeding at wrestling. First of all, I just want to point that out. You know, a lot of people can get into wrestling. It's not that challenging. You go to a wrestling school, you'll pay some money, you'll get trained, you will presumably work for that small promotion. Um, That's how you get into professional wrestling for the most part. What I think 
can become a problem for individuals is that if you want to genuinely succeed in the world of professional wrestling, it's going to require a lot of personal sacrifice. And it doesn't happen just once you become that big star, you're going to be sacrificing even when you are on that, what can sometimes feel like a treadmill, like going nowhere, but you're on that little climb and it may be a very slow climb, but you're on that climb. And that means you're gonna be driving long hours. You're gonna be spending far more money than you're making. You're going to be missing out on quality time with your friends and family because you have to drive somewhere. But I do think that if you wanna succeed in the world of professional wrestling, at some point you are going to have to make that leap. Are you mm -hmm. going to do this beyond what's comfortable meaning and what's comfortable and convenient because for me, it's fairly convenient to drive, you know, 35 miles to go to East Bay Pro Wrestling, which is here in the Bay Area, where, where I've gotten some tremendous opportunities. Mm -hmm. It's easy for me to drive to Oakland 10 miles away to do Hood Slam. Um, it's easy for me to drive to San Jose or be here in San Francisco to do Underground Wrestling Alliance, which is my home promotion. It's not as easy to give up an entire weekend as I did this particular weekend before we were speaking to drive down to Vegas and work a, a, an intimate show that's promoted by three different companies. You know, I was down there with Versus Pro Wrestling, um, a promotion here based here in the, the Bay Area called Full Queer and Wrestle Drag out of Arizona. We pulled our, pulled our talent. We did a great show in front of a re very receptive, but not immense audience, you know, and it took me eight and a half hours each way in a car to fulfill that obligation and commitment, that is gonna be pretty standard. The other things that I think that advice I would give for somebody who wants longevity is that most of the time, you know, the promoters are not gonna be necessarily be coming knocking on your door. They will, you know, they're too busy in their, their own area to really be paying attention to what smaller companies outside of their peripheral vision are doing. So what I personally did is I knew I wanted this mm -hmm. and I went knocking. I went knocking and knocking and knocking. And you know, you'll knock on, it feels like being, this is gonna be a very dated reference, but back in the day, there were like door-to-door -door vacuum salesmen and door-to-door -door, you know, encyclopedia salesmen and magazine salesmen and there were salesmen. Mm -hmm. And you know, and those, individuals knocked on a whole lot of doors and got no or slammed in their face or nobody would they'd peek through the curtains but wouldn't even answer before one person would engage with them and give them an opportunity and perhaps you know be a, a satisfied customer at the end of it i think that in the world of professional wrestling sometimes the anticipation seems to be that success is going to come very easily and very quickly for people and that's not the case, you know, people may look at me and think I'm in some kind of an overnight sensation, you know, because I popped up on their television set somewhere eight months ago and they're like, where did this person come from? What were they doing? And the truth was I was grinding for six years before that actually happened. And even six years isn't much time for mm -hmm. some people. Sometimes it takes a decade or more to become that overnight sensation. Um, so, for people who really want it, you're going to have to find your joy in other ways besides whatever it is that you think of as that big success. Being on television or you know, being at WrestleCon or whatever it is and being recognized, that isn't always, like that may be the, the destination you're looking at, but that journey along the way, there's a lot of high points on that mm -hmm. too. And you really need to get very comfortable finding solace and appreciation and gratitude for small victories because there's going to be a whole lot more of them than those big moments not everybody's going to have a wrestlemania moment um and if that wrestlemania moment is the defining thing that in your mind will be success 90 percent of the you know i would say let me say that 99 percent of us in the wrestling industry will never have that moment so if that's the only thing we're looking at then we're all going to be very dissatisfied and disgruntled but I get to go out and be in front of an audience, whether that's 50 people or a thousand people or 5,000 people and do what I love in a way that's never been done in the United States before. I get to carve my little piece of wrestling history and I get to live a dream that's been with me since I was a very, very young person. That is success. Mm -hmm. And I think if we look at it that way, 
you get to have a lot a lot of successes before maybe even the one big one happens for you i could not agree more with that statement a lot of people have like tunnel vision and they have once they get set on something that's it or it's nothing um it's good to have that but don't you find also that like when we tailor our happiness Mm -hmm. to one specific thing it's like i won't be happy until this Mm -hmm. i won't be satisfied until that and then you're busting your ass every day i'm sorry you're you're busting your butt every day You're, you're out there on the grind and if you're only looking at that you're missing all these things along the way that number one can be real opportunities to learn and grow Mm -hmm. and better yourself. Number two can be fantastic memories that you'll have for a long time. I mean, I, I just told you, I drove eight and a half hours plus each way to go to this show in Vegas. That show in Vegas was super fun, but the part of it, I think I'm going to remember is that I spent 17 hours with one of my, one of my wrestling buddies, my, my friend, Fabuloso Fabricio, who's one half of my tag team Money Power Respect, who's sort of like blowing up here on the West Coast. We were 17 hours in a car together, and I know more about him now than I have after than after working together for two and a half years. And I can guarantee you that's the same. So we left that experience closer together. So if it was just about getting there, doing the show, and I I ignored all the rest, mm-hmm. you know, what a waste of my opportunity. And quite honestly, how many times, and this isn't this is like a rhetorical question for, for listeners to think about or viewers to think about how many times is that one thing you thought would make you happy happened. And then you were like, that was it. Mm-hmm. You know, like imagine waiting three hours in line to get on this roller coaster and the ride turns out to be a total dud. And you're like, uh, you know, mm-hmm. it wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. And if all you, if you were like standing in that line for three hours, not like having fun with your friends then you just wasted three hours for, quite literally, like probably a 90 second ride that disappointed you. So for me, I go through my whole life that way. Like I never thought that I would have people like you and your listeners who wanted to talk to me or hear from me about professional wrestling. Like that's the last thing that I would have ever imagined. And now for me, it's a blessing. Every time I get to come on a podcast or a video like this, or talk to people in general, just about pro wrestling, because I, freaking love wrestling you know (laughs) what a gift you know my mom hates it so i could never talk to my mom who's like one of my favorite people in the world um so you know like i get to to live that dream and share my love and passion with people like you who also share that love and passion i i'd like to thank you for coming on and 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 doing this you know this is a passion of mine i'm trying i'm grinding uh you know when i started this 16 months ago like the worst I have, I guess you would say anxiety is the worst feeling is no one's going to watch it. You know, you're going to put all this and work and effort. Mm-hmm. What, what if they don't? What if, let's say that we had this time together and not a soul watches this damn thing. Mm-hmm. That's fine because you and I get to sit here and connect mm-hmm. over our shared love of wrestling. We mm-hmm. get to talk about things. You know, you get to know a little bit about me. I get to know a little bit about you. And so what if, you know, nobody nobody pays attention um i'll i'm gonna like this is one of the the problems that i have going through the world i'm like everybody's mom and therapist Mm -hmm. you know like like everybody like i went to vegas to do this wrestling show came home with two drag children you know like that's the kind of like and everybody at effie's big gay brunch is like oh mom pollo because i'm that person so i'm gonna give you a little piece of my experience this is an advice this is my experience um, and there's a difference, like a, the advice is like, I suggest you do this. And, you know, like I read it on the internet or some shit, like that's supposed to work. Mm-hmm. This is my experience. I did this and it works for me. So as we talked about early on, I, I was a journalist um, and still am. I'm a pro wrestling columnist, a pro wrestling illustrated columnist. I contribute to pro wrestling illustrated also life dream. Boom. Um, but years ago I was writing this weekly column for a popular publication here in San Francisco. I had a weekly column in the newspaper. And one of the things that I, one of these columns I wrote, what the headline was like, I might not be writing this for you. Mm -hmm. I might not be writing this for you. And the 
point of that was I sat and thought about this and it was very like diary esque and like a lot of introspection too, but I sat and thought about it and I was like, one of the things that I never really think about as a, as a con content creator, whether that's journalism or videos or whatever is who might see it. And there's a lot of reasons for that. If, if I'm writing something and I think about who's going to start reading it, then I'm going to become self-conscious and it's going to alter perhaps how willing I am to be honest or upfront or because I want to, I, every one of us has that sort of subliminal thing where we want to control people's perception of us. If I sat here and thought about, ooh, like who might see this? Like I might not be authentic in the way mm -hmm. I think about things or I might try to present a picture of somebody that's not even true because what if that person sees this? You know, it can, it can be very off-putting. And if we are, again, for you, like, if it was about, I must have 5 million viewers every episode, or I'm a flop or whatever, Yeah, that pressure is so overwhelming, you're probably not even going to start. And this thing that I told, um, it's an old saying, but I said it to somebody not too long ago. And um, by the way, it was Ivory, Lisa Marie Varon, like, you know, WWE superstar. And I said to her, remember Lisa, like, every journey starts with one footstep you know a thousand miles starts with one step you know you you have to take the first step and just freaking keep going mm -hmm. or you're just going to be sitting here thinking about what it's like to be a thousand miles from here or whatever and and you know you could just be walking you could be on your way there and so for you like i can imagine i've been in your situation i've been at like i had a podcast i had I had a wrestling podcast on my own for a number of years you had elijah burke on as one of your guests the pope and i have a podcast together but if you don't do it you're certain to get zero listeners if you start mm -hmm. to do it you might show up with five and then it becomes 10 and who knows people might love you so i've learned that it is very organic and to not care you know about about what you're saying just focus on telling the story and do what i'm passionate about because that pressure can be very crippling and the Pope, you know, that was my first interview by myself. And he knew, and he was such a professional, and he said a lot of nice things. And he oh, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, Pope is a wonderful person, actually, but the way he treats me is just an indignity. But <laughs> we are very close pals, though. <laughs> is there anything else going on in your world that you'd like to? You know, one, of the things, about. I, one, one of the things that you just said, like, you know, where it, that fear uh, uh, and can be crippling. Can you imagine? I'm just, you know, I want to, again, like have people think about and put things in perspective. Can you imagine, can you imagine for a moment what it is, could be like for someone like me looking the way I look to walk into the world of professional wrestling. Talk about a daunting task. Mm -hmm. um, I have been and faced rejection. I have. I have been in and faced awkward situations where people have let things randomly slip that were not appropriate or not nice or kind. Um, and, you know, that did not stop me because what other people think of me as is famously said, what other people think of me is none of my, like other people's opinions of me is none of my business. Mm -hmm. My business is being what you see and entertaining the people who want to be or will allow me to entertain them. Can you imagine how daunting it is like on some subliminal level to be paired up with a six foot six th thrill belly and debut in Knoxville, Tennessee, which is legislation currently would suggest not the most friendly place for me. I, I met wonderful, beautiful people there, but it would strongly suggest that things that are going on there mean that, that I'm not their top choice of professional wrestling personality to, to take in, you know, and view. Those things can be extremely, extremely overwhelming and daunting and scary and intimidating but for me 
there can be no payoff. There can be no success. There can be no payoff. There is no opportunity to live my dream if I allow the things that could go wrong and sometimes even the things that do go wrong to deter me from being and doing and experiencing things I've dreamed of for a lifetime, right? So mm -hmm. the, the fact that, you know, I will be March 30th, I, you know, no, March 31st, I'm at WrestleCon. And the likelihood that I'm gonna get a lot of side eyes from people or shocked expressions from people, pretty good. Mm -hmm. Does that make me want to not be somewhere where I will be surrounded by people who could, could very possibly see me, be interested in me and begin to follow my career, begin to follow the products that I work for, that I'm so proud, the work that I'm so proud of doing, like this, the work I'm doing with Silas and NWA is, I think, incredible. The work I've gotten to do with GCW and Effie's Big Gig Brunch, for me, that was life-changing. The work of being involved with talents here on the West Coast, like Dark Sheik, Money, Power, Respect, Marco Mayor, Fabuloso Fabricio, Anton Voorhees, um, Jay Vidal, all of us collectively known as the agenda. We have a, a little faction thing going on here. Those are things I'm super proud of. So if there's a possibility that I can go to something like WrestleCon and face potential, you know, it's not gonna be horrible. I'm not gonna be like in danger, but mentally I could go through some uneasiness, mm -hmm. things like that. I'm going to put myself at risk. I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to live that dream. Just like I think that for you, you know, you had to overcome those fears and mm -hmm. now you're getting to do something that you love to do. And I, I would challenge anybody who's listening to this to, to not be able to relate to that. Every single one of us has had to walk into that job interview or go on that first date or, you know, send in that application for, work or credit check to get a car or whatever, whatever it is you want to do, there's been something scary at the beginning mm -hmm. of it that has been an obstacle. And if you didn't step across that threshold to find out what's possible, honey, you're going to be living a real sad and boring mm -hmm. ass life. <laughs> you're going to get old. <laughs> Thank you so much for the kind yeah, words. Thank you. you for coming on. I would like to do this again sometime. Don't you want to ask me like, Anything that I love about wrestling? What do you want? Like, I'm, honey, I'm talking to you now. Let's do it. It looks like it's too long. And then I've been known to chatter on. <laughs> what What else is going on in, in your world right now? Anything? Any appearances coming up? Oh, my Besides... God. Absolutely. You know, you already mentioned um, the National Wrestling Alliance is going to Chicago April 7th and 8th. And I'm really excited about that. But even just to get to that point from where we are now, March 31st, again, WrestleCon. I'll be at WrestleCon. That's, I'm super excited about that. I'm going to be there with Susan Tex Green, who is a former, like, very legendary from 70s and 80s women's wrestler, and former NWA Women's World Tag Team Champion. I'll be there with, I think Danny Moe is going to be there, or Danny Jordan. I can't remember which one. God, don't tell Danny. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be there with some people. We're going to be promoting the film Out in the Ring. It's a, it's a new documentary film that's making the rounds, which covers the contributions, history and legacy uh, and impact of the LGBTQ community on professional wrestling. I'm uh, very excited about that. It's been a long time in the making and, and producer Ry Levy, the director is having us at WrestleCon to promote that and as well as ourselves. The next day is Effie's Big Gay Brunch. That's April 1st. Um, there at, at the Ukrainian Cultural Center where I've done many, many GCW shows in Los Angeles. And that night, oh my God, I'm so excited. If people are not aware, if you're gonna be in the area, come out to Dresselmania. Dresselmania is a fundraising event produced by um, Gaw TV, Grown Ass Woman Television, Mickey James, uh, SoCal Val, and Lisa Marie. And they're raising money for such a great cause. And they're gonna have as a special uh, guest host, Mick Foley that night. And they're gonna be auctioning off previously worn wrestling gear and um, attire from some of your favorite wrestlers, many of them your favorite female wrestlers. I'm super excited to be part of that. That's going to be that evening. And then the next day, it's the the Southern California premiere for Out in the Ring. So that's going to be a big to-do for me as well. So I have to go through all that and I get to, no, let me rephrase. I get to do all of that amazingness before I even go to Chicago. And then after, not too long after Chicago, it feels like I'm going to be at DragCon. Um, they're 
because I, I just released these new stickers that are so cute. It says pro wrestling is drag because pro wrestling <laughs> is drag. Drag is about transformation. It's about becoming something different and greater than what you are before. And whether that's a luchador's mask or my wig, um, whether that is your, you know, ring gear or the persona that you get to put on in the world of professional wrestling, honey, you're in drag because that's not who you are when you step outside those ropes. So um, I'm going to be promoting the, the concept that wrestling, pro wrestling is drag. And then there's just so many other things that are upcoming. I've got a, a ton. I'm very, very blessed to be so in demand. You are definitely a ray of sunshine in this business. I can tell you that. You're so positive. Well, you have to be. Yep. If you, it, it has to start within, you know, honey, that's the thing. Like, if I don't believe, like, I, I was telling these, so I ha I got these, I, I'm going to just give them a little shout out. These two young up and coming LGBT wrestlers, Blue and Whiskey, they have a tag team called the City Boys. They were down with us in Las Vegas and they train with the legendary Jazz and Rodney Mack in Texas. And, you know, Jazz and Rodney are incredible. Jazz, obviously a Hall of Famer. Rodney Mack, very well traveled, traveled, such an established wrestler. Great individuals to get training from, to learn the ropes, quite literally, of how to do this business, all the ins and outs of it. But they're two young gay men in an area that's not ex especially embracing of that. And I was overwhelmed when those boys said that Miss Jazz and Mr. Rodney told them, you know what, you need to go talk to Poyo Del Mar. You need to connect with Poyo because I've worked with Rodney and Jazz for quite a while now in the NWA. And I think very highly of them. I did not know that they, they thought, you know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't, thought I was horrible, but I didn't know that they saw me as somebody who could mentor two of their children. When you're a trainer, these are your children. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of the things that I was telling them, when the world gets you down, like when things start to get you down, like when you start to feel not comfortable or good about yourself for some reason. Um, and for me, I will, I'm going to be super transparent. My weight fluctuates a lot. And sometimes I'm like, sometimes I'm not wearing very much or I look like I'm not wearing very much, even though there's a whole lot going on under the, to make it look like there's nothing, but like, you know, and sometimes I'm like, how are you going to be this bombshell? If you're not at your ideal weight, if you don't mm -hmm. feel good about yourself. And I told those boys and I would tell anybody, I wake up every day and I waddle my big ass straight into that bathroom, look at myself, stark naked in the mirror, take it all in. And I say to myself, mm, you might not be where you want to be, but honey, you are still that bitch because being that bitch does not matter. Mm -hmm. it does not, is not based on what anybody in the world sees. It's based on what I feel about me. And if I don't feel if I don't believe that I am that bitch, I will not be able to walk into a dressing room with enough confidence that I could get those sideways looks, or I will not be able to go in front of a crowd where I know that there are people out there who disapprove, not of what I'm doing, not of my talent or performance, but of who I am. They disapprove of my, who I am, and therefore I will never have an opportunity to prove them any other way because they are pre-made up, their mind is set. I will not be able to inspire people if that is something I'm capable of doing. If I don't believe in me, how in the hell, how in the hell else is anybody expected to believe in me? And so I told them like, this is a, it's an inside job. It is an inside job. And it's something that I work on daily because not everybody wakes up. Like I don't wake up with like rainbows shooting out of my ass. Like that happens later in the day. I have to get myself adjusted, but you know, the fact of the matter is, if you don't, if you don't find yourself entertaining, nobody else can. If you don't find yourself worthy, nobody else will. If you do not find yourself valid and deserving of chances and opportunities, it's very unlikely anybody else will. So I live my life that way. And when I see other people, again, this is back to that mom thing. Like when I see other people who are, who are not doing that, I'm like, no, honey, we need to get you together. We need to like snap you out of this because you can't like what you're feeling might be valid. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean like you can't feel depressed or feel down. Those are part of like our natural experience. 
there's a distinction between acknowledging like I'm not feeling my best today and like and just accepting that as reality like you know like okay I don't feel my best like I don't feel like I'm pretty or good or like worthy but that doesn't make my feelings facts mm -hmm. and if I act like my feelings are facts that's going to guide everything in the world so when I see other people do that I have like this amazing beautiful online community that supports me and like they'll join me like on my twitch channel I have a twitch stream where all we stream is old school wrestling and they'll be on there and they'll tell me like their little they'll chat it up and they'll tell me little things and I'll be like oh I give them pep talks like no bitch you need to snap out of this we're not doing this you're not I'm not letting you go down that road you can you have two hours to sit in that place you know but then you mm -hmm. need to snap out of it and get into action like you can feel a certain way but you have to take actions that are going to the contrary because if you start acting the way you feel you're not going to go anywhere you know we will not all feel wonderful every day and if you waste your time like focusing on I'm this girl no you can't do that you can't and and like your friends can allow you to be in that place but they will not allow you to stay in that place agreed thank you um for being you this has been a very positive experience um you have certainly motivated me you really are mom <laughs> I, it's like it's undeniable like mm -hmm. i i i kind of hilariously enough i debuted in into wrestling and like within a very short period of time like after especially after big a brunch it's like well Poya del mar is like the wrestling world's drag mother mm -hmm. you know like your fairy godmother who's just like let's get this together honey come on like i'm your <laughs> cheerleader i will cheer you on but i'm also going to kick your ass if you need your ass kicked like there's a you know it can't be all like you go it's okay honey it's mm -hmm. like okay well this is not okay mm -hmm. so pick your ass up and like let's work to make it better let's do something about it <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited for you that you get to interview these um great people that hopefully are inspirations and that you're a fan of their work that they mean something to you mm -hmm. that i know is rewarding for you because i've been on oh, that yeah. side right mm -hmm. i've done that so i'm happy and excited for you and i'm very grateful that i got to be part of that journey for you Thank you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate your time. If there's anything I can ever do to help promote or anything that you need, feel free to reach out. Well, thank you. I appreciate that very, very much. Hey, everybody. It's Morty. It's Brian. And thank you for watching today's episode of Developmentally Speaking. If you could, please click that subscribe button. And don't forget to punch that bell icon so you can get notified whenever we go live or drop a new video every Monday. Well, thanks for watching, guys. And we'll see you on the next Developmentally Speaking.